We are so glad that you're here today. Uh, in case you haven't been with us, we've been in this series called Seven Words to Change Your Life. And appropriately today, we are ending this series with the word thanks. Now, in case you haven't been with us over the, over the past six weeks, we have been exploring and discovering that just one simple word uh, when, when mastered in life can make all the difference. Just one word, when you commit to it and live it out, God will do big things in your life. It will upgrade your life. Life-changing words like enough and help and yes, no, sorry, wow. And today, we conclude with the word thanks. Now, I know what some of you are probably thinking. You're probably thinking, okay, Steve, thanks is a nice word, but, but is it really game-changing for me? Right? I mean, I mean it, it, it's polite to say thank you. That's, that's how I was raised. My parents raised me to say, always say thank you when someone does something nice to you. It's a, it's a great recognition of generosity or love or, or someone doing something nice for you. But, but is it really game changing? Does it really make a difference in my life? Well, I'm, I'm here to tell you today, I believe so. In fact, I believe that, that this word thanks, just this small word thanks, can be the catalyst for something serious and something good in your life. It is the catalyst for a life of gratitude. In fact, I would say that gratitude isn't just a one-time thing. Gratitude is a mindset. So that word thinks helps create this mindset in your life where, where everything that you look at in life, the lens by which you see the world at the center of it is this word thanks, is a, is a mindset of gratitude. I, I think the Bible talks a lot about thanks and gratitude. In fact, the Apostle Paul, uh, in a letter that he once wrote to a bunch of Christians living in this city called Thessalonica, uh, listen to his words that he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. Listen what the Apostle Paul writes. He, he writes to these Christians in Thessalonica. He writes to Journey Church in, in the 21st century. Listen to what he says. He says this. He says, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Be thankful in all circumstances. I mean, it, it, does, does Paul really mean this? Like really every circumstance? It, it, or is he just exaggerating things to make a point? Like, be thankful in every circumstance. Is he serious about that? Come on, no, no one's thankful in every circumstance. I mean, be thankful when it's 10 below zero in the middle of winter here in Chicagoland with a wind chill of negative 30. Be thankful for that. Be thankful for uh, you're on 290 and someone uh, hits you in the behind because this, this, this jerk, I mean, this person in the back was texting and they hit you. Be thankful for that. Be thankful for you. Uh, you had just bought the new iPhone and all of a sudden it falls to the ground and cracks the screen and you have no insurance for that. Any of you guys experienced that lately? Be thankful for that. Like, come on, Paul. I mean, be thankful when our sports teams don't win. And what, what's Paul really saying here? He, he expects us. Now, notice what, what it, it is interesting how he words it. Uh, because just by the wording here, it's not a suggestion, right? I mean, it's not like Paul's saying, hey, hey uh, you know, just try to be thankful more often, okay? More often than not, try to be thankful. No, it's a command. And he says, be thankful in every circumstance. I mean, it's not even possible as a human being. What, what is he really trying to tell us? I, I, I think at the heart of this, this verse and what he's talking about is that he wants us to look at life through the lens of gratitude. Everything that we see in the world around us, that we, we look through life, we look at relationships, we look at circumstances, we look at our future, our past, our present, we look at all of it through this lens of gratitude. That's what I think Paul is talking about here. Now, this is huge for us. It's huge for you. It's huge for me. Spiritually, emotionally, physically, relationally. 
You know, research says, has come out and, and, and said that those who consistently have this attitude of gratitude in their lives, research has shown this to be true. This is, this is other people, not me saying this, that, that those who are able to maintain an attitude of gratitude in their lives on a regular basis, they are less likely to become depressed. They are less stressed. They are less anxious in life. Uh, in fact, those who have an attitude of gratitude throughout their life, uh, their, their friendships and their relationships are healthier. They have a stronger faith in God. I mean, the upside to an attitude of gratitude is huge. But here's the deal, and I think we can all agree with this, is that's not always easy, is it? I mean, it's pretty difficult at times to be thankful through all the ups and downs of our lives. In fact, I, I think there are two uh, gratitude killers that make this incredibly difficult for us to obey this command that Paul gives us. The, the, first, is, uh, the first gratitude killer is a, a sense of entitlement. A sense of entitlement. And I was thinking about this week, you know, our culture, uh, we, we just have this sense of entitlement, don't we? I'm not talking about generations coming up today. Some of you guys might be dissing the, the generations coming up today saying they, they just have a sense of entitlement. No, I think it's all of us, to be honest with you. I think our culture's mantra is, I deserve, Right? I deserve this, I deserve that. This is my right to do this. This is my right to do that. I mean, it's, it's what we know. All of us are like this. Uh, about five years ago, a bunch of us pastors, we went down to Orlando, Florida to a church conference for those who were starting churches, sort of like Journey Church about six years ago. And we were all, there were four of us, we were staying in a hotel room and we were just goofing off. It was about 10 o'clock at night and we were uh, flipping through channels. We come to this one uh, show uh, that no one but Dave had seen and it was called, I gotta be careful with this, it was called Hardcore Pawn. Any of you guys ever seen that? Got to be careful with that phrasing there. But, uh, but uh, that was five, six years ago when pawn shows were like all over the place on cable and TV shows where, uh, and hardcore pawn, uh, they basically follow this pawn shop in Detroit, Michigan and just some crazy stuff. And Dave's like, dude, this is so funny. We got to watch this. And I'm like, are you serious? And he says, yes, I'm going to make you, uh, you know, sit here and watch it for a half hour. And if you don't laugh, uh, we'll switch it. And I'm like, okay. So it, it's pretty comical if you've ever seen it. And the show that we were watching, there was this lady that comes in and she's trying to pawn off her fur coat, white fur coat, it looks beautiful. And after about 15 minutes, the owner comes up and says, this isn't a real fur coat. It looks nice and it looks real, but it's not real. I'll give you 15 bucks for it. Because, of course, he's going to sell a fake fur coat for about $60, $70. So he's making a profit off it. He says, I'll, I'll give you $15 for it. Well, on the show, the lady goes ballistic. Like, she has in her mind $350 for this fur coat. And she gives, us this, she gives the owner this sob story. And she just goes ballistic. And she starts screaming and yelling. And the owner says, you know what? I need you out of my store. I'm not going to give you anything for it. She keeps on screaming and yelling. And at the end, she says, I, you owe me $350. Give me my $350. And I'm thinking to myself, like, like lady, he doesn't owe you anything. Like, you, you're in here. You're lucky if you're going to get $15 but she keeps on screaming, you owe me, pay me my $350. And, and all of a sudden she gets out of control and starts uh, hitting things and moving things. And they actually had to get security. Literally, they are carrying her out, screaming and yelling, you owe me $350. And they finally get her outside. And I was thinking about this this week. Hasn't that become our mantra and mindset in our culture today? You owe me, right? I've done this or done this and you owe me or I deserve this. I mean, that's the overarching sentiment of our day, isn't it? Entitlement, listen guys, entitlement is the enemy of gratitude. It will kill any chance you have of experiencing genuine gratefulness in your life. The, the other gratitude killer is, is not a fun word to say, but it's, it's true, complaining. It's a gratitude killer. And, and so I want to ask you this question this morning. Be honest with yourself. How often do you find yourself complaining about something? 
Just think about that for a second. Be honest with yourself. Uh, you might be complaining about the weather today. You might be complaining about your circumstances or your job or your health or your relationships or your spouse or, or your friend or your boss or, or even church. See, complaining will not only rob you of your gratitude, it will negatively impact every relationship that you are in. And I think that's what happened to this group of people that we find in the Bible, in the Old Testament Bible, the Israelite nation, God's people. We find an interesting story in the book of Numbers. Now, if you've ever tried to read the Bible, it's early on in the, in the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And most people, when you start getting to the book of Numbers, you skip it really quickly after the first couple chapters. Because if you've ever read or tried to read the book of Numbers, it's, it's a bunch of Numbers. Some of you guys are awake today. It's a bunch of numbers and a lot of names that you can't pronounce. And so usually you skip over the book of numbers, but there's some really cool stories in there. For example, there's this uh, one story where, uh, let me set the scene. The, the people of Israel, they had been slaves in Egypt for 400 years. In fact, that's all they knew. Uh, their people had been around for 400 years and, and for, from the very beginning, they were slaves. They were oppressed in this place called Egypt by this guy named Pharaoh. And that's all they knew. And one day God looks down and, and, and he thinks to himself, I don't like this. And so I'm going to make these people my people and they will be my people and I will be their God. And I'm going to rescue them from this oppression. And so that's what happens. He sends this guy named Moses out and he says, I want you to rescue them and I will give you all the supernatural powers you need to get my people freed. And so Moses does that. And so uh, they, he miraculously rescues them from this oppression, this slavery, not only that, he promises them. He said, I'm going to give you your own land. And I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you as much as you want. And you can roam and, and create a huge nation. A land flowing with milk and honey. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that, right? And so, so they res God rescues them. And as they're leaving Egypt, they get into some trouble, but God rescues them. And then they start wandering around in the desert, this barren desert. And they wander, and they wander, and they wander. But God still has a plan. And not only that, he decides along with this plan, he says, I know they're wandering around in the desert, and I've got a plan for this, but I'm going to miraculously make sure that they're alive, and I'm going to feed them every day. And that's what God does. Every day, like clockwork, God sends down from heaven this food to feed them in this barren land. And, and, and they look at it. They'd never seen this type of food before. And they, they, they said manna. They called it manna. And manna, the word itself literally means what is it? Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound very appetizing to me, right? Whenever you get food and you have to ask the question, what is it? That's not a good sign. Imagine being at Thanksgiving and you're passing around this dish, right? And you guys have all had that aunt or uncle who have made something that you cannot recognize, right? And you don't want to touch it. My grandmother, she, it would be green, uh, green everything. And we're like, this does not look like something we should eat. And you're like, what is it? And you were like, no, thanks. I'm, I'm good, right? So, but the deal is with this manna, it was actually the good stuff, okay? Uh, I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but uh, manna was essentially honey-infused pita bread. I mean, that's pretty good, right? Honey bread, that's, that, that sounds really delicious. And most importantly, this bread was keeping them alive in barren land. Now, you think the Israelites would have been grateful, Right, check this out. God rescued them from oppression. They're no longer slaves. They're free. They're getting honey bread every single day from heaven miraculously. You think they would have been uh, having an attitude of gratitude that they would have been so thankful for this. But, but check out what the Bible says in Numbers chapter 11, starting in verse six, uh, uh, verse four. Listen to what it says. It says, then the foreign rabble who were traveling with Israelites began to crave the good things of Egypt. And the people of Israel also began to complain. Oh, for some meat, 
they exclaimed. We remember the fish we used to eat for free in Egypt and we had all the cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic we wanted. But now our appetites are gone. All we ever see is this manna. And what's interesting is to note is they left out one important detail about their experience in Egypt. They were slaves for 16 to 18 hours a day. These people slaved and they were labored uh, under horrible heat conditions. They were being beaten as they work. And here they are complaining. So put yourself on God's shoes for a second. You've rescued this people. You've saved them from years and years of oppression. And now you're miraculously giving them every single day honey bread. And all they can do is complain. All they can do is complain. And that didn't sit well with God, as you can imagine. So he speaks to Moses to speak to the people and look Look what he says. Verse 18, he says, And say to the people, purify yourselves, for tomorrow you will have meat to eat. You were whining, and the Lord heard you when you cried, Oh, for some meat, we were better off in Egypt. Now the Lord will give you meat, and you will have to eat it. And it won't just be for a day or two or five or 10 or even 20. You will eat it for a whole month until you gag and are sick of it. For you have rejected the Lord who is here among you and you have whined to him saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? Wow. You will have so much meat that you will gag on it because you have so much. Like God saying, you want meat? I'll give you meat. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, my dad, whenever I got in trouble, I'd start crying. And he'd say, you want something to cry about? I'll give you something to cry about. Any of you guys have parents like that? I still don't understand that, by the way. I mean, God's coming. He's coming hard at these people, right? Listen, God is so concerned about the lack of gratitude of his people. Hundreds of years later, he's still talking about it in the book of Psalms. He's so hot about the lack of gratitude of his people back in Egypt, back in the, the desert, that even in the book of Hebrews, thousands of years later, he's still referring to this one moment in time. Why is this such a big deal to God? See, my complaining, and this is something we have to understand, my complaining, your complaining, when we complain about anything or everything, it offends God. It offends God because God's up there thinking to himself, listen, I gave you everything, Steve. I I created this whole earth for you. The sun, the moon, the stars, the mountains, the lakes, the oceans, man, it's all for you. And And I did it in a way that it was able to sustain itself for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Plenty of food, plenty of water. I, I gave you everything. I, I've given you shelter. I've given you transportation. I've given you life. I've given you breath. I've given you family. I've given you, I've given you everything that you need. I've given you freedom, especially those of us in America. I've given you all everything you want. In fact, I gave you the most important thing that I could ever give to you. I, I was willing to sacrifice it. I was probably was, was debating in my own mind whether I should do it or not, but I gave you my only son. John 3, 16 says, for God to love the world that he gave his one and only son. He gave, he gave us everything. And he says, yet still, you find ways to complain. Nothing seems to satisfy you, does it? Now, if that stings just a bit for you, that's okay. Because to be honest with you, it stings me. Every time I find myself complaining, I, I, need, to, I need to check my attitude and realize how much God has given me. We're no different than the Israelites in, in, in the desert. If, if we could just obey that one command of Paul, be thankful in every circumstance, look at life through the lens of gratitude, I I think it would make it all the difference in the world for me and for you. 
So how does that happen though? Like, how do we do that? Well, I just want to share two quick things that I think will really help you to not only master that word thanks, but to, to allow that to be a catalyst so that you can have this attitude of gratitude throughout your life, no matter what you are experiencing. The, the first is this, is eliminate the when-then thinking. Eliminate when-then thinking. Now, this is something I've struggled with my entire life. I've struggled with it my entire life. It's this idea that when I do this or when this happens, then I will do that. You, you, you ever struggle with that? I mean, I think we can all relate to that. When I, then I will do this. When I can get some time off, when I can have vacation, then I'll be okay. Then I'll, I'll be distressed. When, when I get married, then I'll feel complete. When I have kids, then I will have purpose in my life. Uh, when, when the kids get out of diapers, then we will have our lives back, right? When, when the kids leave the house, then we will have our freedom back. Uh, when, when I get enough money or get a new job or get a raise, then I will get what I want. Then I won't be as stressed about my bills. When I am able to retire, then I will have all the freedom to do what I want and so on and so on so on and so on. It's this when then type of thinking. It's like we convince ourselves there's, there's this, this some major event that's going to happen out there that when it does happen, it will fix all of our dissatisfactions and all of our problems and all of our worries. We have to begin to fight through this type of thinking. We have to eliminate this type of thinking in fact, I love what Psalm 118 says. It says, uh, uh, for every day is new with God. And we can rejoice in every day. We take time every day just to say, God, you have blessed me today. I'm not worried about tomorrow. Man, I, I'm looking forward to that. And I hope this will happen in my future. But I am going to find joy in today. I'm going to not... Uh, or I'm going to actually fight the urge to think ahead and be wishful thinking about something that I think is going to fix it all for me. I'm just going to focus on where God has me today and be thankful and have an attitude of gratitude right here, right now. And I, I have to, you know, confess to you, uh, after my sermon, I'm going to give a, a couple updates about where we are in our building process. But uh, the last three or four months, it's been exciting, but it's been challenging as well. Uh, deadlines haven't been met. And we were expecting to be fully in here the last couple months. And I've been so looking forward to being in our own space for the first time in our six-year history and having this grand opening, reaching more and more people for Jesus Christ. And, uh, and, and that's come slower than I had wanted and I've got to be honest with you, I, I, uh, the last three or four months, I haven't been as grateful as I've needed to be. I've been so focused on getting in here and having our grand opening that I think I've missed some opportunities to be thankful and how God has provided for us every week through this transition of Journey Church. And I can tell you, I can't go back in time and change that. I wish I could. I wish I could get back those three months where I could find the gratitude. But no perfect people allowed here. I'm, I'm a human being, but I can tell you this. I can learn from it. And I can move forward and realize that in the moment, God wants to teach me something, that God wants me to be thankful for what he has for me today and not focus so much on what's gonna happen next to fix all of my problems. So eliminate the, the when then type of thinking. But the second one is this, and it's just as important, is be the one who circles back. Be the one who circles back. And here's what I mean by this. There's a story in Luke chapter 19 in the Bible. It's this incredible story about where Jesus is heading down to Jerusalem. And on the road, the Bible says that he meets 10 lepers. And the lepers come to him and, and they say, have mercy on us, Lord. 
In other words, they, they wanted Jesus to heal their disease. Now, you have to understand that back in Jesus' day, leprosy was the worst of all diseases. Like, it was the worst thing that you could ever have. I won't bore you with all the gruesome details, but just know that leprosy started with boils and blisters all over your body, face all the way down. And they would grow, and they would begin to disfigure your body. And, and, and you would look like a monster, Every part of you started to become disfigured. Not only the pain and the itching, the endless with these lesions on your body. At some point, the, the pain would be so tough and so rough that you would just take something to scrape the boils off and then make it worse. At some point during the disease of leprosy, uh, uh, your fingers and your toes and any body part your nose, your ears, they would begin to just literally fall off. I mean, it was the most horrendous disease that you could ever get. And in those days, it was thought to be highly contagious. And so what they did with lepers is they would kick them out of society for the most part, and you had these leper, le, leper colonies. And, and, and you, just, you couldn't interact with anyone normal. You, all, your whole life, all it was were lepers. You were shunned, maybe from your family, from your spouse, from, from religious church assemblies like this because you were, got this disease. In fact, if you were walking down the road and you were a leper and there happened to be a normal person coming along, you would have to yell out and scream, uh, leper, leper, unclean, as loud as you could to warn that person to get off the road. And that was the life of a leper, if you could call it much of a life. And so these 10 lepers come to Jesus and they say, please heal us, have mercy on us. Uh, for whatever reason, they knew that Jesus had power and they said, please get rid of this disease and, and, and look what happens. Jesus does this. He, he does what he always does and he has compassion on them. And, and get this, he heals every single one of them. Their lives were changed forever. I mean, can you imagine being a leper and being shunned by everyone and now you can be back with the people you love. Change their lives forever. But check out what happens in Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 15. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. This man was a Samaritan, meaning, meaning he wasn't even a Jew like Jesus. Jesus asked, didn't I heal 10 men? Where are the other nine? Has no one else returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to him, stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. Ten men's lives were changed forever for the good. And yet only one circled back to give thanks to God. In fact, research shows that, that about 10% of people who receive something gracious come back, complete the circle, circles back and says thank you. And this is so critical to us because every blessing that you have received in life if it isn't turned into praise, then it's turned into pride. And you begin thinking that you deserved it. And again, the cycle of entitlement kicks in. You think if you don't praise God for something good in your life, something good that happens today, if you don't go back and follow the circle back and say, thank you, God, ultimately that will turn back into pride. As if you deserved it. As if you were entitled to it. So my question is this, will you be the one? W will you be the one to circle back? Will you be the one to circle back and say, God, thank you for everything that you've done for me. And I'm gonna worship you every day of my life. I'm gonna come to church every Sunday and worship you because you're great and almighty. I'm gonna worship you every single day in the way that I can because I, I, I know how grateful I am because of everything you've done for me. Will you be the one? Will you be the one? 
God, I, I know I'm go, I've gone through some tough times and it's, it, I, I, there's some things in my life that I'm just really struggling with and I can't imagine life being any worse. But God, I thank you. You've blessed me. You've given me life and shelter and freedoms. Will you be the one to circle back God, you gave, you gave me your most precious gift, the life of Jesus Christ. And without him, I would never be able to work my way back into a relationship with you, my creator. And, and God, I, I want to thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ that, that releases all the guilt and the shame and the sin in my life and all the junk and, and, and makes me a new person and makes me feel whole with you. Will you be the one who circles back and simply says, thanks. Enough. Help. Yes. No. Sorry. Wow. Seven words that will change your life. Let's pray.